Welcome to The Access. I'm your host, Heavy Buzo. In this episode, we'll be discussing the U.S.-China trade war, the effectiveness of economic sanctions on Huawei, and the improved economy under President Trump. To talk about all of this, we are joined by Riley Walters, policy analyst at the Heritage Foundation, and Thomas Dusterberg, senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. Thank you so much both for joining us today. In today's episode, we're going to be talking a lot about China because this is the major, uh, I can call it today, war by the United States, the economical war against China. And I, I do want to go in depth because people want to know and learn more about the details and the reasons and the potential outcome of this campaign by the American administration. Um, in your opinion, why are we seeing this administration so tough on China economically before we get into the details? Well, I'll give it a start. Yes, um, Tom. Thank for you. many years, the United States uh, thought that China would um, become more like um, Western countries in the sense of uh, an open economy. And th theoretically, they believed that uh, China would liberalize its political system as well as some other countries in, the, uh, in Asia have done, Korea, Taiwan, uh, amongst others. But um, the growing economic um, uh, power of China over the last especially 25 or 30 years since they opened up um, and became more uh, market-oriented in some aspects of their economic organization they became a great competitor to the United States. And um, that undermined some of the major industries in the United States, or contributed to undermining many of the industries, especially the, the industrial sector. And uh, there was growing discontent in the United States uh, because the, the uh, political interests, if you will, the economic interests, of the, uh, for lack of a better term, the industrial uh, middle class, the industrial workers was, was uh, fairly neglected and there was a lot of hollowing out of industry. So no, neither political, major political party in the United States was addressing those concerns. Um, and Mr. Trump uh, cleverly as a politician picked up on those concerns and it was one of the things that helped him get elected as president. So it was that growing economic um, uneasiness in the United States along with the growing power of China which led uh, this president, this administration to uh, decide to um, more directly confront China and I might add there's bipartisan support in the United States for that effort. For that effort, uh, unprecedented effort against China, would you like to add anything to that, Riley? Yeah, um, certainly the the economic concerns are one of them. I think if we look at the Trump administration as a whole, there are a lot of voices going on right now, um, trying to uh, influence the way that we approach China. Certainly, uh, you know, we have concerns about their strategic interests, their violation of human rights and uh, you know uh, religious freedom, things like that, and so this. This tends to bleed across the different sections. So, you know, economic security, economic security, mm -hmm. um, a variety of these issues. And so, uh, I think on the economic issue, one of the additional issues, at least that I think the Trump administration has, is well, the Trump administration has a very old view of economics, the way that the economy is supposed to work, this way that the economy is supposed to run, and so they. They look at certain indicators, like the, the amount of trade that we do with China, and they perceive this as a, a net bad. They see this as a negative thing, uh, and therefore they feel that it's time for this to change. And I don't necessarily agree with the approach that they're taking, but certainly a lot of people in Congress are uh, willing to make concessions to this administration at this time right now to allow them to do what they're doing. But so I see that you don't agree exactly with what they're doing, even though Tom thinks that this is uh, the right approach to countering China. I would say, you know, generally within Washington, um, there there's not so much disagreement about the, the concerns we have about China. I, I don't think there's anyone who will dispute the issues that we have with things like intellectual property theft or the other things I mentioned, like security concerns or human rights violations. Um, 
There's still some debate, though, on the economic effect mm -hmm. uh, that you know that's perceived between the U.S.-China relationship. Um, I think more of the debate, though, comes around how we deal with this. And so, certainly, the Trump administration has taken one approach. This is applying tariffs on the imports that Americans buy from China. Um, there are a multitude of other ways that we can deal with this, address this issue, uh, which I can go further into. But um, I think that's that's the debate: is whether the way that the Trump administration has been going about it is the right way, or whether there are better alternatives. Well, we'll talk about that better alternative. But Tom, I want to ask you: What do you think? Um, in terms of the new big issue, which is the Huawei sanctions, and this type of ma major, um, basically, a boycott for a lot of those supplies and, and the, the technology that this company needs. And I mean, th this is going to really affect China. China is really angry about this. Can you give us a little bit more insight on what is going on there and why this specific company? Well, there are a lot of things at work here. Um, one of them is uh, the national security concern, uh, which bleeds over into a more systemic challenge from China. And it's not only that they're uh, challenging us in terms of um, uh, economic performance and theft of technology and uh, possible uh, dominance of the high technology sectors of the future, of which Telecommunications is certainly one of those. But this bleeds over into uh, um, differences in values um, because the Chinese see uh, the world in their own eyes. They see themselves as a uh, uh, regaining their rightful place as the, uh, the middle kingdom mm -hmm. um, and as a, as a superpower. Now, the specific case of uh, 5G uh, communications is important because um, it is an enabling technology of the future. Mm -hmm. um, you think about 4G, which, in which the United States dominated, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the services that we have come to enjoy in the United States, um, such as uh, Uber and Lyft, Facebook, mm -hmm. Uh, that sort of thing is all enabled by 4G technology. Mm -hmm. 5G will enable what we, is called the Internet of Things, uh, where millions of machines will communicate with each other, and that mm -hmm. will add to uh, much more economic efficiency. Mm -hmm. And if China dominates that sector, then, then some of these uh, subsidiary um, services that go along with it will be in jeopardy in terms of uh, U.S. or Western mm -hmm. dominance. Um, the value problem is that China does not um, believe, uh, as we in the West do, that people have a certain right to privacy, that mm -hmm. intellectual property should be uh, protected, uh, that people's personal information should be protected. Um, and so if China builds the core of the communications network of the future, they will have access to all that information. Um, and while in the West um, it's possible, Google, Facebook have exploited the ability to get information, mm -hmm. there are recourses. Uh, we can go... Uh, for instance, and apply the uh, European privacy uh, protection laws and opt out of, um, uh, of being watched over mm -hmm. by, to a certain extent, not totally, yes. of course. Because the United it, States has more kind of, there, there is more kind of, they know more, the companies, right, than Europe. Is that what you're saying, the comparison in terms of privacy? Like... Um, well, in, in term, um, the only point I'm making in terms of privacy is we have recourses, legal recourses mm -hmm. in the United States and in Europe to uh, prevent indiscriminate use of our information. Yes. And, and we saw that what happened uh, with Facebook when they refused to give information to the government and there was a debate because there is laws to protect private citizens in the United right, States. Right, and they're going to end up paying a huge fine. Yes. Um, so if Huawei dominates that sector, then those protections will be lost. And one final point, I'm going on too long, but no, one final point, point is that it gives China access to 
uh, if Huawei were the dominant player, they're already the dominant player in, in China and their systems are being built, Africa, the Mideast, places in Europe. That's the 5G. The, fi the 5G, uh -huh. yeah. That gives them access to big data. They mm -hmm. will have all that data. They have no compunctions about how to use it. They can steal the technology that they can derive from that data, but also in developing artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, that gives them a leg up uh, uh -huh. in another enabling technology of the future. So that's why, uh, all for all of those reasons, uh, the United States thought that it was best to um, take on the, the challenge of Huawei. Mm -hmm. So Huawei is basically the main company that is able and capable of making this technology advance in China. Is that what you... Huawei is the, the leader of mm -hmm. fifth generation of 5G telecommunications development, uh, not just within China, but internationally as well. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, it's because they are the, the leader, they are perceived in Beijing by, by the Communist Party as sort of a national champion, right? So they mm -hmm. are basically, you thought of, I don't know, Ford times 10, mm -hmm. the backing of the government, that, that kind of thing. So they're a national champion. And so because they're a national champion, not only do they, they gain favor within Beijing, right? But they also are, you know, if, if they're attacked, if they're singled out, like the United States has been doing with uh, its friends and allies in Europe as well, Beijing takes notice of this, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's where you sort of get this um, uh, snowballing effect uh, in sort of the diplomatic realm, in the economic and security realms. Mm -hmm. um, but putting that aside, I think if we're looking at the, the Trump administration's priorities on, on Huawei, on 5G, certainly there are a lot of concerns, right? There's concerns about uh, competition in the next generation of telecommunications, what that can mean for our economies, what that can mean for security reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what this administration will try and do is still try and separate out the security concerns from the economic concerns. Mm -hmm. right? So we have these tariffs that we've imposed on China right now. Um, and there are, there are very specific reasons for this. Um, many of them I can go into, but Huawei is not necessarily named as a reason for these tariffs. Now the president's, you know, quipped that maybe he could make a trade in the trade deal regarding Huawei. We saw this um, something similar last year with a different Chinese telecommunications company. Uh, but I, I would, I would purport that they're not going to, right? They're going to mm -hmm. continually try and address Huawei in a separate track. Mm -hmm. Right now, the Department of Justice is actually investigating and has indictments against Huawei for a number of concerns, right? Intellectual property theft being one of them. Uh, encouraging bad behavior, just corporate practices, mm -hmm. um, of course, uh, avoiding and breaking um, Iran sanctions. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of these concerns, and so what the administration will probably try to do is say, this is a, this is a security matter, this is a legal matter. The, the trade issue, these are concerning. Maybe mm -hmm. in the rhetoric and the talking points, these things overlap, but they're going to try to take separate routes. Would you like to ask something? I do have a, a quick question here because it's kind of interesting when you're talking about the China could actually have a heads up or, a, you know, kind of being ahead on like 5G technology versus the United States and the West. Why is there that gap? Why could China be ahead on such a advanced and futuristic technology? Well, I, I think there's debate about, in, in terms of the core technology, who's really had, there, there are American companies that, that are uh, competitive, I think. But the advantage that China has and Huawei has is they have uh, massive government support. I mean, they have a protected home market, and it's the biggest market in the world, so they mm -hmm. can deploy this stuff and perfect it. Uh, they are good. Lots of good engineers in China. Uh, they do steal technology, mm -hmm. um, and they get less control by the government. Oh. They can do anything they want. Basically, <laughs> basically. I mean, we could quibble about that, but mm -hmm. the other thing is that they're they're they do get subsidies, and when they compete with uh, Western firms around the world, they can have the advantage of having basically subsidized uh, financing. So uh, they go into a country, countries in especially the uh, less developed world, but also in Eastern Europe, um, they can offer a complete uh, infrastructure system 
and then they can offer cheap financing mm -hmm. and they can build it very quickly. So they're less expensive, partially because of history of subsidization, but partly because of, of cheap financing. So that gives them an advantage, mm -hmm. a big advantage. What would you like to add to They that also, um, Huawei is a different kind of company than most American companies. Um, they, if we're talking just about 5G, mm -hmm. um, they provide, or they can provide top to bottom, basically everything, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you're talking about Western companies, right, or the development in the United States, you have to go to a telecommunications company like AT&T, right? Mm -hmm. And they will provide the cell towers and some of the, the regulatory hurdles, and they'll get past those. Then you have to go to a private company to provide the actual technology that underpins the 5G um, more on a local level, right? Mm -hmm. So something like Samsung, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's a couple just sort of macroeconomic differences, right? Um, 5G itself will proliferate mostly in big cities uh, because the way that the cell towers, there's, for 5G, <coughs> kind of like 4G, you need many more cell towers closer together. And this mm -hmm. only really makes economic sense if it's in a big city. Mm -hmm. right? So how many big cities are there in the United States compared with China? Not as many. Uh -huh. They have more people, um, especially on their, uh, on their East Coast where a lot of their cities have benefited from trade with the United States mm -hmm. and other countries. And so this is where 5G will proliferate. Um, because they have the government favor and because they have subsidies, it also allows them to uh, skirt some of the regulations that you might typically see of, uh, of a private comp competing company. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, the United States, the problem that we have with developing 5G, I'm sure a lot of European countries do as well, is because of local regulations, right? Mm -hmm. So right now we have a debate between not just the federal level, but the states as well. So competition between, you know, can these states get, or can these companies develop towers in this state at a certain spectrum? Mm -hmm. um, well, the government said, the federal government says yes, but maybe the local government doesn't yeah. say it. And so that... The complications um, of that, the bureaucracy. It diminishes their competitiveness. Mm -hmm. It diminishes their ability to, to actually develop these things so that we can take advantage of them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Tom was getting to this point earlier about 5G. You know, one of the concerns that people have about Chinese development of 5G domestically versus our development of 5G is they're afraid that China's going to be able to sort of master this quicker than we can. And then mastering that is going to allow them to increase their production, uh, production of high tech goods, uh, be able to basically outcompete on other levels, right? So competition, manufacturing, production, that the United States and Western countries just won't be able to. Which the United States is superior in, in that way because the Silicon Valley is here, and the fear is that this kind of technology would become more prevalent in China versus the United States. In your opinion, the, the countries that are basically in between the United States and China, who are allies of the United States, but close enough to China, they fear China. There's some sort of, you know, also business and work relationship with China. How, how is this gonna affect them? And especially that it doesn't seem that this kind of um, policy is gonna be leaned uh, or, or becoming, you know, less aggressive anytime soon. Well, um in the past, until the United States really changed the direction of its policy with China, which was um, to accommodate China, to try to bring China along and hopeful, hope that it became more like the West and followed the rules of the West, those countries in between didn't really have to make a choice. They could work with both and we didn't put any pressure on them. Now, uh, because of the sharpening of the differences and the new aggressiveness of U.S. policy, we're getting to the point where they have to make hard choices. And it's true that, as with uh, 5G, uh, um, China offers a, a, a choice that, uh, especially countries that are not as wealthy as uh, the United States or Northern European countries, uh, Central European countries to a certain extent, they need some help. And China is ready, willing, and able to uh, provide them um, access to modern technology like, like 5G, but also high-speed rail. Mm -hmm. And they will do so on a subsidized basis. And a lot of countries, like in Eastern Europe, where uh, China is, is, they've signed on with China to build a high-speed rail from 
I believe it's uh, Budapest to Zagreb. Mm -hmm. um, there are all kinds of things like that going on where the Chinese offer what's essentially development aid, which is, which is needed by mm -hmm. a lot of countries. So it's making those choices much more difficult for, mm -hmm. as you call them, countries in the middle. What would you say about that, Riley? I think countries, you know, um, in the middle, I don't, you know, we're calling them that, but, you know, they're, <laughs> they're, <laughs> um, they're, they're just not as large, right? Um, yeah. So they are both taking advantage of this, I think, as much as they can, but mm -hmm. are concerned at the same time, right? So let's say you're the, the mayor of Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam, mm -hmm. right? And not just the Chinese, but everyone. Uh, from from any country uh, is talking about how great 5G can be and mm -hmm. why you need it or else you won't be able to compete. Yes. So they're going to say, okay, well, we need to get our hands on some 5G. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, <laughs> basically, who are you going to go to, right? You're you're not that wealthy of a city, right? But you you feel that you need this for your the de development of your country, for the development of your your individuals. Huawei happens to provide the cheapest of that. Yes. What gets complicated is when the United States starts sanctioning Huawei and its subsidiaries and starts punishing the companies that work with them, uh, again, for mostly security reasons, mm -hmm. right? evading U.S. laws, mm -hmm. breaking the U.S. law. Um, so that's where it becomes a little bit more of an issue. And so it makes it harder for those countries and those companies, or those individuals, to make that decision. But if we're taking a step back and we're looking at the U.S.-China tension that's going on right now, um, there are other ways that countries are taking advantage of this, right? So Vietnam is a good example of one country that's actually probably benefiting the most from this right now. How? Um, they see a lot of manufacturing and a lot of investment inflow because companies, uh, whether they're American or European, aren't quite sure whether U.S.-China business relations are going to be good next year. Mm -hmm. and they're, they're worried that the cost of bilateral trade or investment between the United States and China it's just going to become too expensive. And uh, the uncertainty has sort of driven a wedge in uh, business decisions. And so mm -hmm. where do you go next? Well, you go to relatively competing, but um, open and welcoming environments nearby. Uh, Vietnam just happens to be one of them. Malaysia, other countries in Southeast Asia, um, they're taking as much advantage of this as possible mm -hmm. right now, even though there are still limitations. But there's a risk achieve. with that. So they're taking advantage, but they could be a kind of a the, payback eventually if things become worse. There can be. Uh, it depends on how, right? Mm -hmm. And so with Huawei and other concerns about, like say, export controls, the, the ability for the United States to regulate not just the technology, but the sort of the information that we export, <clears throat> companies are concerned about that, and mm -hmm. especially how it's directed not just at China, but other friends and allies. I, I yes, would just please. add on, on that point that mm -hmm. Chinese companies are starting to move production uh, into Southeast Asia, Mexico for that matter. Mexico. Yes, the Chinese business people are not stupid. Uh -huh. And they see the impact of the trade tensions and the tariffs. Mm -hmm. And you're, uh, I, there are stories about Vietnam, since you brought that up, which is mm -hmm. a good example. Do they have the capacity to, and the workers, mm -hmm. to make, I mean, lots of them are sort of uh, traditional manufacturing jobs mm -hmm. and, and textiles and clothing and shoes and leather and mm -hmm. furniture and stuff like that it should take a fair amount of labor. But anyway, China is, Chinese businesses are also thinking about these tensions and mm -hmm. starting to hedge their bets by moving some production out of China. Mm -hmm. They're anticipating that this is going to be a long-term American policy. Mm -hmm. So China. What are the options for China? What could China do? And I know I jumped to this question because there are other things I want to be covering uh, about this. Well, How could China, with its gigantic economy, yeah. evade the U.S. sanctions and uh, restrictions? Well, um, I think certainly a lot of this right now is driven by the United States. Mm -hmm. um, you know, politically speaking, China is a, a, an easy target. Actually, it's politically positive to be tough on China within mm -hmm. U.S. politics. And so I don't foresee that changing any time over the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, that's what businesses, I think, are also seeing. Now, how China can mitigate this. Uh, yes, it can continue negotiations with the United States. 
perhaps they can come to some sort of resolution and agreement regarding these, these tariff issues. But that doesn't mean there won't be the periodic ebb and flow of sort of our diplomatic and economic mm -hmm. relations. Um, China also has some domestic problems to, to worry about, just like any other large macro, uh, macro mm -hmm. economy. Um, it has issues with like rising labor costs mm -hmm. and uncertain um, just regulatory environment, um, just its, its own domestic politics to deal with. So mm -hmm. companies are, to a certain degree, taking this into consideration in addition to the tariffs. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why they're making the, these uh, decisions. How China can improve? Well, that's what the United States is trying to actually do right now. Mm -hmm. um, if you've heard President Trump and other folks from the White House, they say they don't want you know, the, US, the Chinese economy to collapse. In fact, um, if the U.S. and China can come to some sort of resolution and reform and open up China a little bit more, um, then in fact it would be beneficial for China's economy. And I don't disagree with this. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is, you know, the Communist Party um, has some limitations on how far it will actually open up. Mm -hmm. um, whether it will be enough to encourage companies to stay is, is one question. The other question is. Well, we've already seen this in the past. It's the, the Communist Party will actually restrict the ability of companies to move out of China. Mm -hmm. They'll just say, well, you're here now. Deal with it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I, I, yes, Tom, I, I, I do have a question. I mean, I, I agree basically with everything um, Riley said uh, on that. But there, there are other things that China can do in, in addition to kind of negotiating with the United States. I mean, they, they have ways to put pressure on us as well. Mm -hmm. They can work with their allies around the world, and they use their investments, for instance, in Europe and uh, Africa and South America, mm -hmm. to get those countries to um, not support the United States in various ways. Mm -hmm. um, also, our economies are increasingly in interdependent. And we buy a lot of things from China that can't be easily replaced by, um, or quickly replaced by production outside of China. Mm -hmm. And China is very clever about uh, getting choke points in the, the global economy and trying to control those. Um, things like uh, rare earths, or, you know, rare minerals that are very important to some technology industries and high-tech industries. China controls a lot of that production. Mm -hmm. They control a lot of the cobalt mining in the world, which is mostly done in Africa. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to have an electric car industry, you got to have massive batteries, and the cobalt is one of the key elements that goes into that. Uh, they can also... Um, and China can provide that or no? Well, China is increasingly of... controlling mm -hmm. uh, global mineral production in things like cobalt. They're trying to get into uranium as well. Mm -hmm. but, um, so there are ways that China can strike back, if you mm -hmm. will, and hurt the United States. What about Europe? Because uh, there's, you know, we saw in the, the terms of the Iran sanctions, the European Union some countries were against the United States being really tough on Iran. And they were trying to convince their companies to stay within Iran, even though the companies knew better and decided not to. Um, in your opinion, what is the role today of the EU in, in their view of this conflict? We know that some countries are unhappy with this new policy by the administration. With regard Correct. to Iran or China? Or China. Both? It's China, China, because we saw the disagreement on Iran. I'm just trying to see in relations to China, how do they view this policy? Well, I, I don't think they've fully decided yet. I, I mean, um, China is increasingly important as an economic presence in Europe. We mentioned a few things in, earlier in the discussion. And, um, for instance, um, the Hungarians and the Czechs were, have sided with China in some of the disputes with the United States and so hampered the ability of the European Union to respond um, and get a unanimous response to what the United States is asking them for. Uh, to me, the jury is still out about where Europe is going. I mean, 5G, again, is another 
uh, prime example. Um, some countries are adopting the technology. N nobody uh, that I know of in Europe has fully sided with the United States and banned um, uh, Huawei technology, whereas you can see in Australia, New Zealand, and a few other places, Japan, they have banned. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think Europe is still trying to decide how far they can go with the United States vis-a-vis -vis China and trying to weigh both the economic, and political, and national security elements that go into this sort of uh, this rivalry. Mm -hmm. what, about, what do you think, Riley? Because you also mentioned that there's some countries in Europe that are more willing and they probably need China versus others. So what do you think of this? I mean, conflicted kind of position yeah. by the EU as a union, but then also by some countries, other yeah. you know, versus other countries. I mean, there's there's definitely a division, I think, among the member states of the EU on how to not just balance their relationship with China, right, uh, but balance their diplomatic and economic relationship with the United States. Mm -hmm. um, if we take the Iran sanctions as an example, I think the the big difference to note there is that we we are not sanctioning companies that do business with China. Mm -hmm. At least not directly. I mean, you can say if you you know read the rhetoric that comes out of the United uh, the White House on companies that do business in China. Mm -hmm. um, this is different from the legal action that's taken, like in regards to the Iran sanctions. Um, if we take, um, for example, the, the, the divisions, right? The, so there's the divisions between these more southern and central east European countries that, you know, aren't necessarily as wealthy as the north and northwest countries mm -hmm. um, or the eastern, or sorry, western countries, right? But even within the western countries, right? So if we talk about like Germany, for example, Germany has this, they're, 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 they're having a struggle even domestically mm -hmm. on how to balance um, their company's interests in China because mm -hmm. as you know US companies are worried about the business and their business in China that actually leaves opportunities for other countries like Germany to take advantage of this mm -hmm. um, and they might not be so willing to throw down throw away the their relationship with China um, at the same time the United States is implying applying their own tar tariffs and rhetoric against the, their country so it's, it's a tough balance that they're trying to strike. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, just like I was saying with the Southeast Asian countries, you know, European countries are both going to try and take advantage of this in certain areas, but at the same time, um, they are democracies, they are capitalist countries, so they will support the United States to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. um, I think definitely the concerns that the United States has with China are echoed throughout the European Union. Uh, the question at the end of the day is, whether we can all come to an agreement on the best approach. And mm -hmm. right now the United States is taking a unilateral approach, so that doesn't really leave a whole lot of room for cooperation. Could, could yes. I add something on that? Um, something I've written a lot about. Um, if the Europeans sided with the United States, and, and um, for instance, it, it, there is the alternative approach to what the unilateralism of the United States mm -hmm. is to go through the World Trade Organization. Because, yes, and I was going to ask about this next, so please well, go ahead. Yes. China, China is a member of the World Trade Organization and claims to be a, a supporter of the, this, the international rules. They, they break them all the time, and everybody knows that. Mm -hmm. Europeans know that. Um, so we could, and to a certain extent we did, we brought cases uh, in the World Trade Organization to sanction China mm -hmm. um, because, for instance, of intellectual property theft. The Europeans did support us on that. But on other elements of, of the disputes, we've gone ahead and the Europeans have not been as, uh, as anxious to, um, to support us. Mm -hmm. we, we could have come together and decided, well, here's how we do this through the World Trade Organization. Mm -hmm. And if we had succeeded in doing that, uh, then I think the pressure on China would have been even greater. But the, for a variety of reasons, one of them pure business interest, mm -hmm. um, as Riley said, the Europeans are, German car companies are doing fabulously well in China right now. They don't want to jeopardize that. So they've been a little bit more reluctant to, to support us across the board. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, so the World Trade Organization would be a way to kind of have a more of a uh, you know unified effort against China. Um, were you talking about having reforms also in the World Trade Organization in a way where China would not be able to break those laws that used to and continues to do or break? Um, well, I'll go shortly. I'm sorry. Uh, I was I was just going to say. Go, go. Uh, so right now, the Trump administration has a lot of complaints with the World Trade Organization. Mm -hmm. So it's very tough to actually bring any cases and dispute them through that system right now, um, which makes it difficult to address all these issues and concerns. Um, potential reforms uh, could help bring the United States back into this system. And mm -hmm. re reforms aren't so much focused on um, addressing the things China can and can't do, that, that is a part of it. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of the concerns more are based around the organization itself and the way that it, it works and mm -hmm. its efficiency. Um, for example... Is it like the United Nations in terms of its yeah, efficiency? It, it, yeah, it can. <laughs> so uh, sometimes it takes unanimous uh, decisions. Um, but the, the cases that countries bring against other countries, they, these can take a long time to litigate. And so that itself is a concern, right? Mm -hmm. So um, if you have an issue now and it's not resolved for another six years, well, who knows, maybe in six years the issue isn't really an issue anymore, uh, either because it solved itself or it's just destroyed whatever companies you had in your interests. So this is one concern. Um, the, the system itself, what, what sort of the benefit of the WTO um, is right now, again, the United States is taking unilateral action. And this has allowed China to reciprocate with its own tariffs on U.S. goods. Uh, China actually has an interest in the WTO um, and maintaining some sort of stability there, or at least its stability there. What it doesn't want to see is unilateral, I'm sorry, um, a <clears throat> group effort of sorts. It doesn't want to see the United States and the EU and other countries bringing collective action against China. Uh, and so that's one of the hurdles. That's one of the issues that we have is that we can't do this. We can't take a more efficient collective action against China mm -hmm. um, when at the same time we are unilaterally acting and not deferring to these multilateral systems. Okay. Yeah, well, I would just yes, add please, one, one Tom, quick, I want to know about very this. quick thing. But yeah. there, there are, we do need new rules in, in addition to the so improving that's the, the functioning. Mm -hmm. Yes. But, um, so form, the content needs to be changed too mm -hmm. because for instance, the digital commerce is not well covered by the WTO rules right now, nor are uh, rules on the behavior of state-owned enterprises, so two of the major issues where U.S. is talking to Europe and Japan and others uh, to try to agree on, on implementing new rules at the WTO, but it's very hard because China can help to block those. Mm -hmm. And the Europeans are reluctant, for instance, on too strong rules on, on uh, state-owned enterprises because Europe still has a bunch of them that they eh, don't want to jeopardize. Um, so I'll leave it at that. You also wrote, Tom, about the built-in road, um, and you've told us about that as well. I want to talk about this kind of China road to for businesses within um, the international community in general, the, the way they work with the rest of the world. What would be the challenge now to kind of uh, I mean, how is that going to be affected by this new posture by the United States? And whoever wants to say at first. <laughs> well, Tom. I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just to backtrack a little bit, the, the, the Chinese economic system is built up on uh, competition within China. Um, and for instance, the steel industry is the sort of the poster child of how they operate. Um, they have a national goal of producing so much steel, and this applies to all kinds of industries, but let's use steel as an example. Every major city, every region wants to have a steel plant so mm -hmm. they can get subsidized partially from Beijing, but also partially from their own local resources. It usually results in overproduction. I mean, steel capacity in China is something like uh, you know two thirds of the entire world demand. So the only way they can prosper is uh, continue to prosper in that system is to export stuff. Mm -hmm. And 
So they, they, they've done that for years and years, and now the Belt and Road Initiative, which is setting up the infrastructure for trade uh, from China across the old Silk Road, o across the oceans, um, to especially to Europe, but increasingly to South America and Africa as well. That is an extension of the, um, both the I ideology of China as the Middle Kingdom, but also the economics in which they need these global markets to continue to grow their e economy. What can we do to counter that? Again, um, w we, we have to work with our allies. Um, for instance, there's a concept called the free and open Pacific, which is being developed by Japan, Australia, India, United States, uh, to try to, in, in whatever way is possible, counter the Chinese infrastructure development, and also on the national security uh, uh, questions to, for instance, keep the South China Sea more open than the Chinese would like it to be. Mm -hmm. The, the flaw in, uh, in the, the Western approach, if you will, is we, we're not devoting the resources collectively that the Chinese are putting into their Belt and Road. Mm -hmm. So um, the United States is just starting to think about how its international development um, tools uh, can be strengthened and work with some of our allies, especially uh, Japan and Australia, which are much more... Um, engaged in this because they're <clears throat> in, in, the, in the Chinese sphere anyway. Mm -hmm. So, but at this point, we really can't effectively um, uh, challenge China on most of their infrastructure projects and offer countries that really need this help or think they need the help uh, a, alternative. a viable alternative. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Riley, in terms of the built in road? Yeah, um, certainly <clears throat> there are a lot of concerns that Western countries have of the Belt and Road. Um, one of, I think, the most starking is the influence that China could potentially garnish from those countries, you know, in addition to all their other economic activities that they have with these countries. Um, another concern is just sort of the, 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 the local environment and how China can shape that. You know, if, if China is giving money to corrupt politicians for these you know, let's say ports or things like that, then that's just sort of encouraging even more corruption. And so that's not something we'd like to see at all. Mm -hmm. um, another question or another concern that a lot of uh, Western folks have is the ability of China to actually gain control, physical control within these areas. Um, uh, an often cited example is a port in Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. which basically couldn't pay off the debt based on the loans that China provided for them to establish a port. So the local Sri Lankan government essentially had to give them the lease to the land and said, mm -hmm. this port is now yours, which a lot of people saw as a potential security threat. Uh, Sri Lanka is a, a um, sort of a, a spot for naval fleets to stop through um, mm -hmm. on their way around the, the Horn of India, uh, either transporting between East Asia and uh, or West Asia and East Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this is a concern. Um, Tom was also getting to the point of their ability to sort of take control of resources. Um, there's a lot of Chinese investment in Africa, for example. And again, uh, this investment, while some areas need it, right? Some, some areas really need uh, investment. Mm -hmm. uh, it might not always be on the best of terms. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, it disadvantaging the local governments. Mm -hmm. um, but it also might be just not necessarily to the benefit of the folks who are receiving it, or, or maybe they're not even receiving that money. And so you might get, you know, you hear these reports of uh, projects that start, but don't always finish. Um, and it's not necessarily because of um, um, uh, certain issues. It's, it's usually because of maybe things like corruption or the fact that the projects themselves weren't really profitable to begin with. You know, bring into question, well, then why did we even begin this project? I, my question is, and I want to start with you, uh, Riley, why is our economy doing good right now, knowing that there is this economical war on China? And how will this war, if it continues in the same way, affect our economy? Yeah, uh, happy to. So, you know, trade with China uh, is significant, right? So we trade over 700 billion worth of goods and services every year bilaterally. So the things that we export and import. 
Uh, but trade with China doesn't make up the majority of our economy. So if we're just looking at gross domestic product, uh, the way that we measure sort of our annual growth in our economy, um, trade with China only makes up less than 3% of this. Mm -hmm. uh, the United States economy, just like China's even, uh, is mostly domestically, uh, its growth is mostly from the, the folks in the, in, in the United States who just go to day, uh, go throughout their day-to-day -day business. So we are uh, domestically strong, mm -hmm. much like China. The problem with this trade war and the tariffs that we see is uh, it, it, it hurts people more on the margins and mm -hmm. it hurts people in, in different ways, depending on what the, the products that are being tariffed are mm -hmm. uh, and to what degree. Uh, and of course, how China retaliates. Mm -hmm. So right now we have <clears throat> uh, tax, taxes, tariffs of 25% on over half the goods that we import from China. Uh, some companies can eat these costs, so they're not necessarily always shifting this onto consumers. Mm -hmm. But uh, as we increase more tariffs, we're not going to see this much more. Mm -hmm. And so what you will start to see are the prices of things, prices of goods in stores beginning to increase. Mm -hmm. And because of China's retaliation, for example, mm -hmm. on U.S. farmers, they're losing market share in China. This is driving down their prices and reducing their profitability which mm -hmm. is forcing the United States government to increase the subsidies that they already give to farmers mm -hmm. um, by dozens of billions of and dollars. And I saw some videos about that. So that's an ongoing that's, situation. Oh, this, yes. yes. Uh -huh. What do you, I mean, Tom, this is a very important question because I think this is what the American people would be concerned about. And then, you know, obviously even other countries, but down the, the road, what's going to happen to our economy? Well, the reason the U.S. economy is as strong as it is is because of two things. The uh, tax reform that was passed in 2017 and the general deregulatory policy of the United States. It's just given a, uh, unleashed the so-called animal spirits in the United States economy and given incentives for um, investment mm -hmm. in the United States. Um, taken away some of the incentives in the tax code to invest outside the United States. Mm -hmm. So uh, that being said, um, tariffs, the, 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 if you just isolate China, uh, I agree with Riley that it's, it's, a, you know, it's a significant but relatively small part of our overall economy. But if we continue down the path that uh, we seem to be headed under President Trump with tariffs on Mexico, mm -hmm. let alone tariffs on the auto sector, which would affect Japan and Europe in a big way. Mm -hmm. uh, our economy could be in some trouble. I, I think it would put us into a recession if we did all of those things, and hopefully mm -hmm. we'll pull back from the brink and not do that. Mm -hmm. It all takes a little bit of cooperation from the other parties that are involved. You know, maybe maybe the Chinese will decide it's in their interest to get some agreement. Uh, maybe the Europeans will back off on their agricultural, their insistence really not to negotiate with us because of agriculture. Um, maybe something will happen at the U.S. border to, to ease the, uh, the flood of people coming in. But uh, I'm not in full agreement that tariffs are the answer to all of these problems, but mm -hmm. uh, we have the president that we do. Okay. My last question, very quickly, about, you know, the, uh, we saw the press conference between the president and Theresa May, and uh, the talks with the, you know, Britain that, you know what, pull out of the EU and the United States, you know, has special relationship with you, but how could, what would that mean in terms of uh, any promises by the United States to support uh, Britain economically, uh, giving, uh, you know, that that would be something they would probably need, pulling out of the EU? I mean, one thing that we've been uh, strong advocates for, and I think even the White House has been advocating for, is a free trade agreement with the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's hard to negotiate, it's hard for the UK to negotiate uh, individual free trade agreements as long as it's still part of the European Union. Mm -hmm. So um, that's one positive thing that we are trying to you know, give them. Uh, mm -hmm. But the, the issue at the same time is, domestically speaking, we do have all these other trade issues, right? So we haven't passed 
the new USMCA agreement through Congress, which is going to be a little bit harder to pass now, too, that we're starting to increase tariffs on Mexico. Mm -hmm. And we have U.S.-China relations at the same time. So this is taking up a lot of resources, mm -hmm. uh, political capital, which might not actually give the U.S. enough time to negotiate the U.S.-U.K. free trade agreement, at least uh, before the next presidential election. So it's not a priority right now? Well, it can be. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can't. Britain can't negotiate right now because mm -hmm. they're tied to the EU. Um, you know, it was the decision of the British people to mm -hmm. leave the European but Union. But would it help Britain? I mean, that's the question that people keep asking. Like, is it really it, for the it best will, interest? It, it will definitely ha have some transition costs mm -hmm. that will be painful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're going to have to reestablish a system of uh, trading relationships. The United States can perhaps be one of the first to help them in the sense of op opening up trade with the mm -hmm. world's largest economy. But uh, it, I think it's going to take some time for Britain to regain its, uh, its economic vigor. And I mean, this, con this conversation could uh, continue. There's a lot more to cover, but we are out of time for today. That was really a great conversation. Thank you so much both Thank for you. your time today. I'd yeah. love to have you again in the future. Thank you, of course. Enjoy. Thank you. Enjoy Thank the you. chat. That was it for tonight's episode. Thank you for watching. Good night.